Okay, um, we're so, a small group and I, my plan is to kind of tell you in 10, 20 minutes everything I think you should know uh, and then just open it up for a discussion. Uh, I think for me, um, this is kind of an interesting opportunity to, uh, to share this specific project that I'm, that I'm emerging because, um, because it's the, 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 the context here is that I'm not trying to sell you anything and you're not trying to buy anything. Um, and and uh, all of you probably have a lot of experiences and, and knowledge and insights that I don't have. So for me, this is kind of also kind of a good sounding board, talking about thinking buddies, uh, I would love to hear your criticism. Um, let me start by telling you a little bit about me or where I'm coming from, um, because I think that that will help uh, to understand why I put this, this uh, program together. Um, so I, I grew up in a small town, uh, not too far from Tel Aviv. Um, apropos visiting Israel, uh, I have to say that I, I like Israel and I try to visit it too every once in a while. Um, and the reason why I'm saying that is that I live in Tel Aviv for most of my life. And I noticed that, uh, and most of my work is abroad. Um, and I noticed that when, when I fly out and, and clients will ask me, where are you from? I would usually, the, the person that is with me would usually say Israel. And I would usually answer saying Tel Aviv. Okay. Because for me, I, I, I'm more Tel Aviv than anything else. Yet I love Israel. So I do take the time when I can to leave Tel Aviv and visit Israel. It's a really cool place. So uh, uh, I started my career in the field of education. I was, uh, I was very interested in uh, educational program development and group facilitation uh, or process facilitation or group dynamics, all that part. Um, and I was fascinated in the areas that are less academic and more value driven. So anything from how to how you act, you make politics politics more accessible to um, to youngsters, or how you create a culture of democracy in a very dichotomic political uh, region, etc. Um, so I did that um, for, for oh, more than ten years. I had my own company, and at some point we were developing a lot of programs, um, mostly in the in the, in, in the informal education side of things. Um, then I decided to, uh, to fulfill a dream, a childhood dream. Since I was 10, I was, my dream was to become a surgeon. Uh, be but because um, I didn't really attend school in my youth, uh, my last proper uh, uh, class was third grade. After that, I didn't do so well at school. Uh, there was no, no university that would actually accept me. Uh, but by then I was old enough to get admitted to schools abroad um, and I moved to the States. While applying to med school, I, uh, I started to kind of lose my confidence and instead I made a very coward decision and I joined, I joined something that was in, the, in its very beginning back then. It was something to do about computers and networks and stuff like this. I didn't know anything about it, but I really liked the idea and I just dived into it. And for the, the next 10 or 12 years, um, I was... Uh, I was kind of growing in the high-tech industry in Israel, doing many different jobs, mostly around um, uh, systems and infrastructure, um, mostly in the area of uh, ASIC or chip development. So it's kind of a hardcore of the high-tech. Um, and after 10 years there, I felt that my heart is not there anymore, even though business was amazing. Um, and I looked for a new adventure and I came across this company called SIT, Systematic Inventive Thinking, that was doing, again, something weird that nobody knows what it really means, something about innovation. Um, so I was very skeptical. I went uh, to meet the, the uh, founder and the owner of the company. We had one hour meeting. I left three hours later, totally involved, to totally in love. And this is what I do in the last 18 years. Um, Working here kind of helped me to grow into the world of innovation in two very different uh, roles. One is a facilitator. Most of our work is facilitating or managing thinking processes uh, that are result-oriented. So at the end of the day, nobody cares how great your ideas are. 
the, what everybody cares for is how well it's implemented and what, what type of unique advantage it's, it's going to give us. Okay, so it's really uh, hands-on result-oriented. And at the same time, um, I, I, I think I spent about half of my time researching and studying innovation. I'm fascinated by this field. Um, it's big and wide. It has a, it has full of amazing uh, um, elements and also have a, a lot of nonsense there. Now, th this story that I want to share with you uh, started, I think, about maybe four or five years ago. Um, I noticed something that when I, uh, when I speak with my clients, if, let's say, about 10 years ago, uh, most of the conversations were, uh, oh, I want to consult with you about something, or how do you think we should tackle this specific problem? Okay, all within the domain of um, uh, problem solving and creativity and innovation, etc. Uh, I noticed that in the last four or five years, this, this dialogue changed. And now my clients, instead of uh, asking me to, to share an opinion or form an opinion about something they care for, they actually conducting a conversation that is more of a, here are my thoughts and can you tell me what you think about my thoughts? And I, I got curious. And one of the things that, that I thought of is that, oh, let me, let me actually uh, uh, illustrate it with a different analogy. Uh, I remember, uh, I remember a TED talk many years ago that I really loved, really resonated with me. It was a guy who talked about collaboration. I, I don't remember his name. I was actually, just before this call, I was trying to look it up and failed. But during his uh, talk, he gave a very simple example. He said that thousands of years ago, uh, when someone wanted to create a, a, a spearhead for his spear to hunt, uh, he used to go down the river and, and find the right rock on the riverbank and break it and sharpen it and then tie it. Um, and then he got his product ready. And when you look at a computer mouse today, you should know that about 250 different people touched this product before you got it. Okay. It took us very long time. It took us between 30 to 40 years to learn how to work together in teams and be very productive about it. It wasn't an easy revolution. Then going back to my story about my clients and, and the way the conversation changed, I realized that if up until, I don't know, the 40s and 50s, uh, to be a good manager, all you needed to know is what your uh, employee know, employees know and a little more experience, then in the 60s and 70s, it was clearly not enough. In the 60s and 70s, to be a good manager, you need to know what they know, you need to have experience, and you also need to know a thing or two about management. In the 80s and 90s, this was also not enough. And then we realized that if you, in order for one to be a really good manager, he or she needs to know more than their employees. They need to have the experience, they need to know about management, but they also have to have a set of soft skills, okay? That wasn't, wasn't there before that. And I'm looking at managers now and what I see, and again, I remind myself that this is my personal perspective that doesn't make it a, you know, a big truth. But the way I look at it, um, decisions in the last 20 years became more and more complicated. The number of variables we need to consider, managers need to consider when they make a decision is by far larger than, than 10, 20, 30 years ago. The different type of possible consequences from every management decision is widely going and it's di very diverse. So we need to somehow accommodate this complexity. The world is becoming more and more complex and technology, and I love technology and I feel, you know, it's, it's part of me in, in many ways. Technology can only go so far. Technology can help us solve problems, but it could never solve problems for us, okay? Um, uh, we, we, in, in a world of innovation, we, we have something we call the, the creative leap. The creative leap, imagine it the distance that you have to kind of jump from a problem to a solution. It's called the creative leap. Um, and study shows again and again and again that when you have tools and methods and systems and technology, 
it could never make that leap for you. It can, however, get you much closer to where you want to be. But we'd still need people's intellect and instincts and intuition and passion and values uh, to make the right choices. So technology is not there to save us. Now, somebody said once that um, technology get, gets so better, the devices become smaller and smaller, yet our finger stays the same size. And I see the same thing happen about our cognitive skills. Our life become more and more complex, yet in terms of our cognition, we don't have the tools, we don't have the awareness, we don't have the pedagogy that, that help us learn. We don't teach, not children, but youngsters, high school students, how to deal with complexities. We don't teach them how, how to choose. We, we, we're really good at telling them what to choose, but not how to choose. I don't recall, I, I'm involved in the last 20 years, I'm very involved with liberal education. I'm on the board of democratic schools and I do a lot of uh, pro bono work uh, with uh, educators on inventing new methodologies and new ways and new models, etc. We're not there yet. I don't recall any curriculum that talks anything, say anything about selection criteria. Okay? So, we educate people the same way we educate them 20 years ago. When we look at managers, people who are in their 40s, 50s, 60s, business leaders, they, well, some of them are naturally talented. Most of them are smarter than me. I, I, I accept that. But they struggle and they're the exception. Most of the managers that I meet in the last four or five years struggling with that. And this idea of a thinking body actually came up at some point when I thought to myself, okay, if I could not do the, the work that I'm doing now, which I'm totally in love with, what am I going to do after I recover from the heartbreak? And one thought that, that, that I had was that I want to be a thinking body. I think I'm very good at it. I think I'm, I bring a good combination of knowledge and instincts and, and ego. So I, I, I have a, a persona there that can, you know, maybe provoke or challenge. Um, but I also, I have high integrity, so I know how to, to make it about the other guy. And then after, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> after feeling really good with myself and then getting really embarrassed about it, I said, okay, but let's see if there's anything that we can do that is not depending on me. And this was about two and a half years ago when I decided to kind of start and, and, and research that. So what I found out that in the last three years, four years, uh, we see, at, at least in terms of Google Trends, you see a, a lot more mentioning uh, of the term think tanks. It means that companies, organizations realize that one is not enough for, for some, some tasks, which is great. But then I, was, I started to be curious on how these think tanks really work. And what I find out uh, and that made me very disappointed is that I couldn't find any, any good models or manuals or methods for think tanks to, to operate on. I did find some models, I have to admit, but all of them, uh, or let me say it more humbly, I couldn't find any model or method that, uh, that bring any additional value to the fact that you have more than one person in the room. Everything was, was uh, uh, quantitative and not qualitative. So you have more people in the room, you have more knowledge, more expertise, uh, more experience, more opinions, more diversity, more egos. But then when you compare the quality of the ideas, the quality of, of the outcomes that you get from a think tank, and when you get it from individuals, no quality differences. There is a consensus, which is very important. But in terms of score, we couldn't find any, any significant changes. And um, I, I, I complained about it to my, uh, to my boss. I said, you know, it's crazy. In the last year, I've been looking for really good think tank operating systems, and I can't find anything. And he said something he, he's always happy to say. So, so go ahead and, and invent one, uh, which, which I tried to do. And this is what I want to share with you today. So... I started out by collecting a lot of different elements 
that um, the study shows that has a positive impact on the way we think and on the way we act or engage when we're in, we're in group. So everything from cognitive psychology to um, uh, uh, group dynamics, organizational uh, sciences, etc. cetera. Um, and and I, I create a huge pile of different tools and elements. And uh, first by, by a work of elimination, I try to kind of save other redundants and the ones that I didn't think are appropriate. And then I started to uh, create different combinations. Again, I, I tried to consult with some uh, um, uh, education experts and some cognitive psychology experts, and they were all really nice and supportive, but they didn't have uh, practical answers. Um, and, and here at SIT, it's all about being pragmatic, okay? So uh, I had to experiment, uh, and what I did is I created different packages and while working with clients on other topics and, uh, and other areas, uh, I, I experimented with, with the tools, the different tools and models that I found, and also experimented with the way that they affect each other. Because sometimes just different models will not complement the process. Um, and then the last phase was to actually experiment with it. So uh, uh, we ran a short experiment working with, uh, with six different groups. Um, uh, two control groups and, and, and uh, four task groups. Uh, the tasks were also varied in, in different ways. Uh, we paid attention on uh, how much the, we, we get involved within the group uh, work. The idea was that, uh, or my fantasy was that I'll be able to create kind of a kit that comes in a box and you open it and it's self-explanatory and the team can manage itself. Um, I, I, at first I didn't, but my fantasy was not involving people like me managing the process. Um, but anyways, we, so we created different, different degrees of involvement within the, the process with the different groups, et cetera. So we felt that it was a pretty good experiment uh, and we learned a lot from it. We learned a lot, um, both on, on the tools and models and the combinations between them, but also uh, we learned better how to measure the results, what parameters we should look at. We should look at. Um, so that was good. Um, and then for me, the next step in the process was to take the time and, and, and build up like a real uh, grown up uh, offer, like something coherent with backups and with, you know, some reviews and some quality materials, et cetera. Um, and I thought it would probably take me between six months to a year. Uh, but then a week later, I got a call from one of my clients. It's a, it's a huge uh, international conglomerate. The headquarters sits in uh, Germany. Um, and this specific business unit is a, is a business unit that I've been working with for the last four years very closely together. And we created the, the kind of special relationships that every year I come with a crazy idea of how about we'll try this and see if it works. Um, and they think for a minute, it's a, it's a hundred years old company, German, so they're very conservative. Um, so they think about it really good and then they say, okay, let's do it. So for this year, um, when they called, I was kind of out of ideas. And, uh, and I was honest about it. I said, look, uh, I don't have ideas for 2020. That was late uh, 2019. I don't have ideas for 2020 yet. Uh, but give me a couple of weeks and I'll think of something. Um, and they said, okay. And then we, we kind of drifted into a small talk and they asked me, what am I doing? And I was telling them excitedly about this, this idea that I have. And uh, the reply from the other side was, uh, hey, how about if we'll go for it? And I said, uh, there's nothing really to go for because it's not ready yet. And they said, so how about if we'll be the, the pilot for that? Uh, so, um, uh, starting January, uh, I'm running a, a one-year pilot. Uh, we already have 16 or 17 teams in the process, halfway in there. So far, it looks just amazing. I'm trying really hard uh, to stay away, not interfere, not ruin anything. Just, you know, sometimes the best thing to do is let go. Um, 
And I thought that maybe it'd be worth, worth a while to tell you a little bit about it. But I just finished a, a, a 19 minutes monologue. So, so if you want to say something, that'd be great. I can rest for a few seconds and drink some water. Mm. Actually, let me ask you. First of all, uh, are, you, are you familiar with any think tanks, approaches, or methodologies that has some kind of, uh, I don't want to say empirical, but some kind of evidence that they work? And, and the reason why I ask that is because uh, one of the things that I appreciate less in our culture in, our, in the last 10 years is that people tend to confuse, easily confuse between personal style and a method. People say, oh, I've been doing it for years and it works great for me, so I'm going to write a book, create a podcast, and uh, run a, a, a webinar about my method. Uh, and I'm, more, I'm less interested in, 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 in personal development and, and more of established things. Um, so are you familiar with any methods, approaches, models that then maybe I can look up. No, okay. Uh, and another question: Do you does um, does what I said in the beginning about this idea of um, it's getting harder for us to think or make complex decisions because complexity is growing? Is that something you resonate with, or uh, being who you are and where you are? you feel that you have the confidence and the skill sets, also the cognitive skill set, to actually take these decisions and this is actually why you're the right person in the right place. Eris, I don't know if this answers your first question or this question or none of them, but I'm, I'm part of the Growth Hacker team and I don't know if you heard of Growth Hacking before. It has nothing to do with hacking and it also has nothing to do with data science, although hacking is something that you associate with data science. It's basically how you can instrumentalize experiment, which means when you're to, to kind of, I don't know if I see dots being connecting here or not, and please tell me if I'm going in the wrong direction. But when you think about thinking body, it's also about how can you make something that's a headline into something that you get more feeling about it, right? There's this, I have an idea or whatever it is that's basically a headline, and then you yeah. just collect all these headlines, but it still feels intangible and you're overwhelmed by the quantity of ideas. And you feel like, now I would love to have someone sparring against um, these ideas with together. Yeah. And uh, the idea of the growth hackers is to take all these ideas, A, to turn them into a number because data is always bit better than opinion. So you, you, you cluster the ideas with, does it have an impact? Is it, is it easy to start with the first prototype soon and am I confident I can actually do it right because if it's if it's an idea that sounds great but it will take you five years to deploy it it's maybe not a good idea and then you turn every idea into a number and you go and, there, and, and there's a lot more but what it does it helps you taking the weight from the headline and a transforming it instantly into a number and then you can say okay I always follow if there's a total of 100 that the number can idea can score I only pursue everything that's above 95 for just for example, and then, then it gets easier and then you have a team and this team is always cross disciplinary because if you meet someone that's like you, you're just entering an echo chamber, right? But if you meet someone who has nothing to do with what you're doing all day and he's in finance or he's in HR or he's in logistics or he or she, um, that's when sparring gets exciting because they just bounce from their world back to your idea. Yeah. I don't know if that's interesting for you, but I can share that with you in on a I would love that. setting. I would love that. Yeah. I, I wanted to say that um, uh, there, is a, there is a field uh, called cognitive coaching that uses a lot of very simple tools to, to, do, exactly, to do exactly that in terms of, of you know, being a sounding board to someone. Um, I think... First of all, I don't think, I don't know if the difference that I'm making now, the distinction that I'm making now is important or not, but uh, for me, um, I imagine a thinking body uh, uh, is something a little more involved than a sounding board. Um, and in, so this is one thing that maybe, uh, maybe could, could benefit from 
more specific tools or, or, or methods. Uh, the other thing is that uh, regarding, uh, regarding our bias towards uh, quantifiable information, or you call it data, uh, I have to say that first of all, it's, it's really depending on, on what you're doing. If we're talking uh, education or art, then I'm not sure that opinions are less convenient than numbers. It could be the opposite. It's really depending on the issue. But also in terms of, uh, of cognitive fixedness, um, we have cognitive fixedness when it comes to ideas and concepts. But we also have uh, um, cognitive fixedness when it comes to what you call data or structured information. Um, so in that sense, people could experience similar types of, uh, of bias and we need to find a way to overcome that. Um, anyone else? Uh, what yeah. we have tried so far, I think 10 or 12 times uh, so far, we call it sync time. And it's just a format. Uh, we take half a day. And in the first round, we have an expert, for example, if the think time is about AI, we invented uh, or we invite an uh, expert of AI. He gave about half an hour uh, or three quarter and in impulse so that we know what we are talking yeah. about. Mm -hmm. Then it's a small break. Then in the next one and a half hour, each of the... Uh, uh, people here, so we have between 12 and 15 people uh, explain their view of this topic and then we have a break again and after a break we try to find out what we can do together in this special uh, area what we have discussed. And yeah. so far we, we saw it in a moment and most of the things the people go home after the, the afternoon and do a lot of this topic in his or in her company. So, and once we had the situation, especially with the AI, they said, okay, we see that's a, a bigger issue. We should uh, start an initiative. And now we have since uh, last November, we have an initiative called AI Corinthia. So sometimes okay. it's not only thinking, but it's also an impulse to start anything. No? So, but it's not a method, it's just a format what we try in the moment. No? But what we saw, it's, it's quite difficult to find people who are really interested to think about something. So, because yeah. in our, our uh, experience, thinking is hard work and the most of the people are just come and will be consumer. Right. So... What, what I do in, in, in the last 18 years is focusing um, uh, more on how exactly to think about something, okay? So after the inspiration, now you need to come up with an idea or a solution uh, or an observation. How exactly, you, what, what exactly do you need to do cognitively for this to work? We, we kind of... Many times assume that if you put the, the right people in the room, they're smart enough, then they know how to think. Um, it's true to a certain extent. The, we know that the, the older you are, the more of an expert you are, the smarter you are, the more educated you are, the older you are, the more fixated you are. Okay? Um, and uh, we feel that the, probably the best way for... Con for, for thinking together is through a conversation. So there are some tools to manage the discussion, but none of these tools forces us to think differently. And one, one of the things that we know to say very clearly about this idea of thinking differently is that it's something that, that motivation and awareness could not help you with, okay? Mm -hmm. You can only think the way you think. The only things that can change the way you think are external manipulations. You have to have someone forcing you to consider something in a non-intuitive way. You have to have something, you know, manipulating the, the, the thinking process to have you face some possibilities that intuitively you immediately dismiss. So for me, the interesting part is what exactly people need to do while they sit down and starting to think what needs to happen there. So 
if you like, um, I, I can share with you some elements of this mm -hmm. operating system that, that we created. I need to find a better name for it. Um, um, and, and kind of explain some of the elements that are there and why so far uh, it seems to be a good combination. Um, so the kit that we created actually have uh, uh, two elements in it. Um, first element uh, is all about the process, okay? So what do we need to do? Do we have what roles we need to have in the team? Uh, what is the framework? What are the available resources? What should we expect from people? All the normal stuff. On top of that, um, that we have there uh, 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 few recommendations for outcome formats. So if you wanna come up with ideas, here are some formats that are really good for documenting or expressing ideas. If you wanna come up with a white paper or an essay, here are two or three formats that you can use or create your own, it's fine. But just to give you everything that you need so you won't waste time on, on everything else. Um, in terms of uh, uh, collaboration and coordination and, and uh, knowledge sharing, it comes out with links that gives you already create for you a shared area where you can all save your files or set up your meetings. Okay, so everything in that sense is, is ready. You don't need to worry about it. Um, on the other side, uh, and also there are tools there, again, to manage the conversation. There's some good the bono tools. There's some other uh, uh, thought leaders and, and innovation experts that came up with some interesting uh, methods. So it's all there for the team to choose and, and apply. Uh, on top of that, um, what we added are a few elements. One, uh, something that I mentioned a few times before in this conversation, and that is the idea of cognitive fixedness. Um, so, uh, we put a little bit, we, we put kind of a, a, a small activity together uh, for the team to, to run. Uh, it's designed to, uh, in a way that everything can be done in person or online. So, uh, so it's easy to manage. So it's, it's kind of a, a, an activity that, that teaches you a little bit about cognitive fixedness and why motivation and awareness are completely not relevant here. Uh, but it does give you some, some tools to to overcome uh, fixedness. Um, what else is there? Uh, talk a little bit about type of ideas and solutions. Uh, we realize that once people understand what is it that they're after and somebody else helps them with the definition, it helps them to focus. So, so what you get in the end is more clarity. Uh, what else? Um, uh, we added two tools uh, that dealing with the idea of metacognition. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with that, metacognition is our ability to reflect on our thinking process. It's our thoughts about our thoughts. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, please look it up. A very famous and extremely useful uh, tool to use to, uh, to enable a very simple and good effective metacognition is PNI by Edward de Bono, uh, positive, negative, interesting. Um, for this kit, uh, I added another one uh, called STA. STA is see, think, ask. So what is my observation? What is my reflection? What questions could I ask about it? Uh, generally speaking, uh, we put a lot of focus in this kit on questions and not on answers. Uh, and I'll explain why. Um, the two reasons, first of all, again, uh, I'm coming from, from the SAT school of thought and at SAT, um, uh, we know that, um, uh, let me think how to, we know that the way, that the way you think about things really impact the outcomes that you get. So we wanted to focus on the process and we want to be able to um, make sure that we can, we can do that. And one of the things that we do for the last 25 five years is problem solving. Usually uh, organizations will call us in when they have a problem that they can't solve and they tried everything, they're ready to give up, then they'll call us in. And one of the things that, that we learn is that you're more likely to come up with a great solution if you invest most of your efforts 
studying the world of the problem and not the world of the solution. Okay, so questions here uh, it, are, are really important. So, so that's one reason. The other reason why we focused heavily on, on questioning is because that we know that, that there are four strong elements that, um, that are involved with questioning. Uh, one is creating questions is being proactive. You're already doing something, which is very important. The second thing, creating questions is a creative activity, which is also a, an important value here. Um, it's highly motivating. Uh, people are more motivated to create questions than to provide answers. You're welcome to try it. It's, I was surprised. I didn't believe that that observation and I tried it and yeah, it works. Um, but also um, creating questions have a very strong influence on the type of answers we will get. So because of these four reasons, we thought that one thing that the team could share and benefit is focus uh, or large part of the process will be focusing on creating questions. Uh, to do exactly that, uh, we used a, a model called, um, it's called Fertile Question. Uh, it's part of an approach created by Dr. Yoram Harpaz. Um, Harpaz is just the way it sounds. Uh, I, I encourage you to look him up. The guy is a genius. Uh, he's from a field of uh, uh, cognitive psychology and education, and he's a master. In, uh, in everything to do with comprehension, everything to do with, you know, explaining what makes us understand something really good. Um, I know this guy for 20 years. Um, I used a lot of his tools and methods. We also have some other relationship through projects we did together in Singapore and in Israel and in, uh, in other countries. Um, and I remember his model and I decided to pick that part out of his model and I'll tell you quickly uh, what is the bottom. Then again, are you welcome to look it up? It's all in public domain. Um, so it's called a fertile question. And the idea is that the team will create the question that they would like to answer as a team. And a fertile question has very strong six characteristics uh, that makes it or define it as a fertile question. The first one is it needs to be an open question. A question that could have more than one answer. The second one, uh, it needs to be an undermining question. Something that in some interesting way, not just a provocative way, challenge the status quo or challenge some of the basic assumption. It needs to be a rich question in a sense that it needs to be, in able to answer it, you need to rely on more than one fields of expertise or areas of knowledge, okay? So it's many times a crossbreed or, 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 or multi or diverse answer. Um, it needs to be a connected, this is number four, it needs to be a connected question. It means that each and every one of the team members could easily explain how this have an effect or importance in, him or her, in his or her lives, okay? Uh, um, Number five is it needs to be a charged question, which means that it must steer some emotions, whether it's an ethical or a moral question, where it's a, a, a predictive question that people might have different feelings because again, the future sometimes creates some mixed reactions. Uh, it could be a cultural question, but it has to be something, something that is charged. And the last, uh, the number six, the last characteristics is that it has to be a practical question. It needs to be something that once you get the answer, you can, I don't wanna say easily, but you can imagine how you turn some of this into action. Now, Dr. Harpaz tried this model uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s, uh, mostly in high schools, um, in Israel, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, he was able to take a uh, uh, nine and 10th grader and, and through a very short process, a little less than a year, uh, have them uh, uh, create 
ideas or solutions or papers that are rated as a bachelor degree level, okay? So the amazing abilities for the kids. By the way, the students were learning uh, necessary skills as they go along because they realized that, okay, to answer this, we need some basic abilities in data science. So one of us, at least one of us, needs to go in and figure it out. Or for this, we need to talk about the future. How about if two of us will go and learn what terminology uh, futurist uses so we can describe better what we see here. That's amazing, a, bit, a way of also picking up more, more skills. Um, so he worked with that mostly with, with, uh, with young students, or not young, but high school students. Um, but then a few years later, um, he was experimenting with that with grown-ups, uh, with adults, and uh, again, all academically. And when I called him to ask him if I can take his model and play with it a little bit, he was thrilled. Um, and together he helped me to kind of uh, understand what, what adaptations we need to make and, and what to look for so we can get a good feedback to what works and what doesn't. So this idea of a fertile question is in the center of the think tank thinking process. It's not the only one. So I mentioned fixedness and I mentioned uh, metacognition or reflection. Uh, I mentioned fertile question. Um, other elements that, uh, that we added in uh, were uh, uh, common thinking mistakes. So apparently, again, there are, uh, there are many studies that can easily identify common mistakes that we all do when we were just asked to think about something. Or when a good teacher tell, us, tell, us, tell the students, okay, this is, this is yours, go ahead, figure it out. We, 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 we tend to make these common mistakes. Uh, usually these mistakes are unnoticed because for some reason we believe that common sense is good enough. Um, and I, I'm not sure this is always the case. Um, so we talk a little bit about uh, common thinking mistakes, at least we know what to avoid. Um, another model that we, uh, that we took and converted into more of a, an application, it's, a, it's an academic model or theoretical model, it's called the brain dominance model. Again, you're, you're more than uh, welcome to look it up. It's really simple, it's really straightforward. It just shows you the different, um, the different uh, thinking elements that we have. And for us, at least, it gave us not only a really good vocabulary to understand how different people think, but also it's a good, uh, good way to kind of figure out combinations uh, um, to create the perfect thinking text and also a good analytical tool later on to see how these tendencies uh, were actually supporting or, or not supporting the process. So, it's the, so the kit is kind of a cluster of tools. Oh, well, sorry, one more element in the tool that we have is kind of a, um, an interesting uh, or a good, I don't know, an elaborated discussion about settings, okay? So one of the, one of the common mistakes that we have when it comes to thinking is that we have all these thinking habits that most of us didn't really check to see if they're, if they're effective. Uh, simple things, for example, um, um, uh, room conditions. What is important, what is less important? Um, for how many people is it best to think with? Alone? With one more person? With four people? With 20 people? Um, how much time do you invest in creating ideas and how much time one should invest in convergence? Taking these ideas and going through the process of what convergence elements do we have that are really simple and useful to use? So you want to end up, you know, presenting an idea or sharing an idea that will not be so impressive to the listener. Um, so it's all about the settings. Um, what else? Oh, no, that's it. So the kit is kind of a, um, um, a holistic, I don't like that word, but kind of a holistic uh, solution uh, for a think tank. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, when we did kind of a small experiment with, with six teams, it worked amazingly. Uh, 
we're now running this big pilot um, and so far so good. Uh, I, I have to say that on one hand, there's something in me to say, you know, give it some time, finish working on everything, uh, make it pretty and, 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 and nice and ready. Um, but at the same time, I know that I'm a little bit of a perfectionist. Uh, I know that I would never say that it's, this is it. Um, and, um, and even though I cannot commercialize it fully yet, uh, in other words, I don't see how I make money out of it in the next six months of a year or a year, I feel that there's something useful enough here uh, that it will only be kind to share it with others. So um, one of the reasons why I'm happy to, to talk about it is because again, if somebody else will find it useful, then that's great. If somebody will say, oh, this is not nonsense, I'm gonna make my own operating system and it's gonna be 10 times better, go for it, let me know. Uh, because again, if, if I'm right and there's a vacuum there, there's no good, there are no good methods out there, competition could only do best at this point. Um, and the third reason why I'm happy to share that is because again, I get to uh, meet people like you and now I can shut up and hear what you have to say. How can I spar with you on that? I would love to be part of this project. When Let's just create opportunities to do that. If you identify a situation that uh, you can somehow form a think tank or you can connect with an existing think tank and we can somehow support them, I mean, or what, they'll be interested in, sure, what, yeah. But every time I run a tour, I have a think tank. I'm looking at seven people here, right? You guys are a think tank. I never have, Hello? right by the nature of the program, no one ever, ever attends a virtual tour if that's not a curious person, mm. right? If that's not a person who's wanting to shape something. Yeah. So one is, I can put you on the distribution list of every single meeting that I have in the tours. So you can decide where you want to join. So first of all, that's a great idea. Let's talk about it. Let's find the right way of doing it. I'm happy. Uh, I can tell you that apart from this experiment that I'm doing with a client now, uh, I'm also running two smaller experiments with uh, two schools. Um, and one is I'm very involved with the local, the Israeli uh, chapter of Burning Man. Um, so one of the things that I'm doing, pardon? What are they doing this year? Are they taking part? Uh, there's no, there's no Burning Man this year. Yes, there is uh, a physical Burning Man. Yeah, an online one. Uh, with all the respect, I'm old and romantic. Yeah. I need, I need, I need the dust and the sun. It's not going to happen uh, anymore. Pardon? I don't think it's going to happen. I mean, this is a different conversation. I think it's all going nothing, to be fine. Wait, look at me now. Look at me excited. Nothing will stop it. Nothing. <laughs> um, Anyways, um, uh, here in Israel, we have a large community of uh, burners uh, that do a lot of work uh, apart from the, this main event in the desert, uh, mostly community work, a lot of volunteering. So I also run it with them. Now, this is more of a philosophical, cultural uh, think tank. So it's really interesting to see all, all, how on one hand it works on products and technologies and molecules and, and financial models. And at the same time, it works with, with uh, high school kids and it works with, with uh, uh, good doers uh, and volunteers. Uh, what would be the next step that you would help? Um, I think two things. First, if I can find um, one, I, I, I would love to have more, but I, I, in terms of time, I don't think I can manage more than one. But if I can find one more uh, pilot opportunity, uh, that would be great for me. Um, if I can find that pilot opportunity uh, with, with a partner, one of you or someone else, so there's more than one of us doing it, and it's talking about thinking bodies, uh, 
we can share. And I, I really believe in, in co-creation. Um, so for me, finding another pilot, preferably on a very specific topic and not something very wide, preferably finding, uh, uh, looking for something that is easy to compare to kind of a control group or history or so we can see not only that we get great feedback and everybody happy, but also that it's significantly better than the alternatives. Uh, they'll be great. Uh, I'm looking for something that is relatively short. Um, it could be very hardcore business, but it could also be environmental or social. Um, I'm open. So that's one thing that would help me a lot. A second thing that will help me a lot, not now, but maybe in, in two or three months time, is to find a paid opportunity to run a program like that. So, uh, uh, and again, because it's a beginning, of course, everything's going to be very modest in terms of cost and stuff. But uh, I think by now, nobody's sitting outside my office here and and counting the hours that I already put into it. And said, "Hey, we're paying for that. What's what's going to happen?" On one hand, on the other hand, I don't want to overextend that that kindness. And at some point, that's that's my job. There is. Thank you so much for sharing. There are so many questions to ask. I've, as usual, I'm collecting all these questions and email them to me and I'll forward, also connect you with Eris. Keep that conversation alive. Be part of this community who will meet wherever to meet to push the envelope. I think this is really exciting and interesting and great.